We're trying something new today on Developer Commentary. Tony, why don't you tell them about that? We decided, since we're about to get started on Ratchet & Clank 3 uh, very soon, for people who are waiting on that, uh, we decided in the meantime, we'd kind of take a little break and try something a little bit different on the podcast. And uh, instead of just jumping right into Ratchet & Clank 3, we're going to take a look back on a game that Mike and I remember very fondly from our youth. Very fondly. And see if it holds up, you know, with our professional jaded eyes as adults. Yes, our expectations today. And the game we're deciding to go back and look on is going to be Crystallis for the NES. Yes, uh, one of certainly one of my favorite games of all time. Like, I still look at it to this day, and it influences a lot of things that I've done. Right, and... Uh, well, I mean, one of the main reasons we chose Crystallis is because it's one of the few games that you and I both played, uh, you know, way back when, when we were both kids, that wasn't Zelda or Mario or something like that. And we wanted to try to do something that hadn't been done to death and talk about something that maybe people hadn't heard of a little bit too much. Because everybody's heard of Mario and Duck Hunt and, you know, uh, Zelda right. and stuff. Uh, so we, we didn't want to retread that ground. We thought we'd, we'd try something new. Uh, Crystallis is one that we both agreed on that we both really liked when we were kids, and we're going to retread it now, sort of see uh, how we feel about it now that we're not looking at it through rose-colored glasses, and really just get our impression as to how well it holds up compared to the kind of games that people are making now. Now, unlike with the other series, we've actually gone and played a bunch of this already uh, right? To to sort of get our thoughts together on it. And this is the first time where we're really starting to compare notes. Right. And for people that are wondering, this isn't going to be a full Let's Play of Crystallis. Uh, we're definitely not going to be going through the whole game step by step. Uh, we're just going to sort of hit the key points. But uh, I really encourage people who hadn't heard, heard of this game to go back and play it and really just, you know, see what you think. Because it really is a great game and one that I don't think a lot of people have really heard of and that people really should play. So the game dumps you out in a uh, uh, an empty room to start with, and I know you had some thoughts on that, Tony. Um, yeah, I mean, this game was... I mean, I didn't realize until I was going back now just how unfriendly it is to the player at the beginning. Like, they don't guide you at all. And I guess that's symptomatic of a lot of games of that era. I didn't realize it was as extreme as it was in these kind of games where they really don't guide you very much at all. They kind of just dump you in and sort of set you loose on the world. Exactly, yeah. And and this game came out in 1990, so it was kind of at the end of the NES's lifespan. So there are a, a number of things that are a little more modern than others, uh, and you know, you'll see some genre firsts in here. But there are still, you know, like the lack of uh, tutorials and training and stuff like that, uh, you know, whether it's it's done well or not, it's just not really done at all in this game. Right. And uh, you look at this game, and there's a lot of things that they did that were very much ahead of their time. Very, very much ahead of their time. Uh, absolutely. I mean, weapon upgrading and all the sorts of stuff. But so many things were so mired in the way that they made games back then. And, it, you know, there's a lot of bad things that were done in that era that this game also very much inherits. Right. For example, you know, you really do need to read the manual to play this game. You know, that's also, that's one of those things where people sort of look fondly back at manuals as like, oh, I remember loving reading manuals and going through the book and that kind of stuff. But I think what people forget is how mandatory it was to read the manual. It wasn't that you read the manual because, oh, I liked reading the manual. You read the manual because you had to read the manual. So what about this opening, because uh, uh, I remember you, you commented on it, the manual being necessary. What about this opening sort of screams the manual is necessary to you? Well, um, let's go through this introduction pace by pace and talk about how if we were making this game now, how we would actually do the intro to Castellus versus how they do the intro to Castellus. Okay. So to start with, you walk out of the cave. And the guy just runs away. Yeah, the guy says something and then runs off screen. Uh, now, to start with, he does he does show you the direction you need to go, so that is kind of instructive. Right, and so you walk over to that part of the, the town, and uh, you can find, like, the little girl and a few other things here, and they kind of guide you over to the Elder. 
Right, uh, which is this very first house that you'll see if you're if you're coming up, right? Or well, that's or... the thing. There's two. <laughs> Again, that's that's one of the weird things. They tell you to go find the elder's house, and they just say go find him. Did you visit? They don't the say yet, yeah. he's in this house. He's in that house. They don't describe anything about the house where the el- where, where the elder is. You just have to go around, talk to everybody, and say and and just sort of find it. And they don't uh, lock you in either, right? So you could right. completely miss the elder and walk out into the middle of the wasteland and just get owned because you don't even have any weapons yet. Right. Uh, so I think one of the things I would have done differently is from the cave mouth, you, you exit, guy runs away, shows you off screen, and then when you come on this screen, you should see the guy continuing to run away. He should be the first person that you see. Absolutely, yeah. But he's totally not. He's not even on the screen when you come into the screen. He should be the first the first thing you see upon entering the town. And then either you go talk to him, or you move closer to him, and he runs further to kind of direct you to where you're going. Right. Uh, uh, and that's that's enough of a hint to, to tell you what to do. And a lot of games in the Super NES era took that approach. The much more overt approach would be to have messages popping up saying, you know, Go to the elder's house. The elder's house is on the west side of town. You know, all that crap. But uh, uh, I, I probably wouldn't do it that way. Right. So you walk into the elder's house, and you talk to him, and he gives you the sword, which is totally fine. Zelda did it. No problems with it. Sure. I mean, it worked so well for Zelda. Why not just do that again? Because, I mean, why not? Exactly. And, you know, Zelda... Uh... Zelda has the same sort of problem, the original one, where, you know, you could just walk out into the middle of nowhere, get lost, and not have a sword. And I remember the first time I played it as a kid, and I know Mary, the first time she played it, she did just that. She didn't realize that she could walk into that hole, and she just, you know, ran off into the middle of nowhere. Now, here's one of the problems I have. You got the sword, and you raised the sword up and said, I have the sword. Yes. But you're still not using the sword. Because you have to equip it. You have to equip the sword. And the uh, an interesting thing is, is it's really not obvious how you're supposed to equip the sword. Right. Uh, and this is where it comes down to where the manual is your only source that really tells you how to go through the interface. The interface doesn't... They don't guide you through it. Right. It'll say you will get swords. You press the select button to equip swords. But, I mean, even replaying this, I was tripped up by the fact that pressing the start button brings up what appears to be your controls, but doesn't actually let you do anything. Right. So you can't get in there and just uh, 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 equip the Sword of Wind, you know? Right. Uh, but then you have the sword, and then and even then, it doesn't guide you at all about combat. Combat's entirely yours to figure out. Yep. And if you want to save... You have to come into the inventory for some reason, and then press start, which it doesn't tell you anywhere that you you can do this. And this is how you save and load. This is skill number one that you need to know in order to play this game. They didn't have autosaves back then. Right. The only place you can possibly learn that is with the manual. Right. And I remember when I was playing games as a kid, I was lucky enough to have two brothers who were also into games... And the way we would play games, and this is just how it was, is one person would play the game and just constantly be asking questions to one of my brothers, saying, how do you do this? What's that? You know, what's going on here? And uh, that's just how we played games back then. And, you know, and if you got stuck, you had to call the Nintendo helpline or buy a strategy guide. I mean, you know, there was no internet to go to GameFAQs for. So, and that happened frequently. It just was sort of part of the game for us. And here's another one of the things that uh, really bothered me going back and playing this game. So you talked to that guy, and he gave you the hundred, the hundred gold or whatever the currency is in this game. Right. Now, the first quest you're going to go on here is to go and wake up the guard at the windmill. That's the first quest you have here. But what I did when I was going through and playing this game, I got that money and immediately went to the armor vendor. Immediately. Yeah, me too. I I went in and bought the biggest biggest piece of armor I could buy. Right. Bought the most expensive thing because I figured he just gave me the money. Of course I'm supposed to buy the armor. And so you buy the armor, you equip it, boom, done. And you're ready to go out into the world. Right. Here's the problem. You're feeling pretty good about yourself for doing it. Right. But that's a trap, what they did to you there. 
Yes. Because what you actually have, what you're supposed to be doing, is going to the item shop and buying the flute. The alarm flute. Because that's the item you actually need to progress in this game. Uh, and there's no way that you would know that. I mean, like, uh, in a in a normal game, like, quest number two would be, you need an alarm flute, go buy it. And that would be how they trained you on using the shops, for example. Uh, right. Like, for example, if I was if I was making this nowadays with the, the expectations that, that people have for in-game teaching of the mechanics is, you know, I would block off this exit to the town uh, and not let you leave until you did, you know, until you talked to the people you needed to talk to and, you know, you bought the alarm flute or whatever, whatever else you needed to buy uh, to just sort of teach you the basics. And I probably wouldn't teach you everything here because that would overload you as a player. Which would be just as bad as right. underloading you. Uh, so, you know, let, let you buy the alarm flute, let you equip the sword and stuff like that, and then send you out into the world, sort of with a vague idea of where to go. Uh, and that's another problem once you get in here, is you don't even have a vague idea of where to go. Uh, well, uh, if you go back and talk to people in the town, and, I mean, I only figured out because I went and talked to people in the town like crazy... Uh, one of them does point you to the windmill. They say you have to go to the windmill. If you go to the west, you and, will find Zebu uh, in a cave, is one of them. Right, so he, he tells you to go to the west, and there's another guy that tells you to go north and go deal with the windmill. Uh, Zebu says he is having a hard time with the windmill guard. He is always sleeping. Uh, right. But the windmill guard isn't even... The windmill guard doesn't even spawn unless you talk to Zebu first. Exactly, and that was my other problem, is I only talked to the guy that said, go deal with the windmill in the north, and not the guy who said, go talk to Zebu in the right. west. So I went to the windmill in the north, and if you go straight to the windmill in the north, like that guy tells you to do, there is nothing there for you. Not a single thing there for you. Yeah, it just uh, sort of dumps you into an empty cave. And, uh... And you're left sort of not really knowing what to do. Uh, and then you have to go back to the town, and then maybe you'll find the guy that says, go talk to Zebu in the west, and Zebu will tell you to go deal with the guard. But that has the additional problem of if you've already gone to the north and not found right, the you guard. Know that there's no guard there. It's in your head that the guard's not there. Right, so you'll look for any other place in the whole world for the guard except there. Right. So that's also just one of those really unfriendly things that this game really does to you. Is they're kind of just like you do. Th you have to do things in a certain order, but there's no no clues to the player that you have to do things in a certain order. And there's a uh, uh, I bet that the the progression of it was fairly obvious to the people who designed it. This is where uh, user testing comes in really handy nowadays. Uh, and I don't think they did this as much then. Is like if if we if we put this game in front of its intended audience, uh, they would get lost. We would notice it, and we would put in something to help them not get lost. Because while it is fun to have the feeling of exploring and uh, you know uh, uh, going around and, and kind of figuring out what's going on, it's never fun to not know what the game is expecting of you. Right. Yeah. I mean. You have to agree with me that this would be the worst focus test in the world. It would be a very, very... Yeah, it would be very tough. If you were focus testing this game right now, you would walk out of that focus test room with people panicking. Like, what are we... How this game is a disaster. Right. What can we possibly Hundreds do? Hundreds of bugs would be assigned. Uh, lots of things would be overhauled. Right. It would be a very difficult uh, uh, return to the office, for sure. Um... Just in this first part of the game, there's a lot of stuff going on, and no direction whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, back at this point, they're still they're still borrowing from the arcade paradigm, right? They're they're still thinking if we can kill you off, if we can make it longer, you get more money. I mean, that was the that was why that was how game design for arcades worked, and a lot of those tropes just sort of migrated their way into. Games that, you know, that that was not the motivation at all. The motivation was to sell more copies. Right. Sorry to interrupt you. Keep going. No, go ahead. It's, I mean, that's sort of the, the point I was trying to make, is that I think this game, if you just hammer through and to beat this game, you can be done in maybe an hour or two. Yeah. Two hours, this game is over. Yeah, if you're not using a tool to assist it, it's a couple hours long. But... I remember this was like a month 
of me playing this game when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I played it two or three times too. I mean, I I only got it, you know, one or two video games a year, so I made them count. And you know, maybe maybe some of the game design of the era was to account for that sort of thing. But you know, uh, nowadays we consider as a design principle that obscurity is not, you know, uh, it, it's not gameplay. Reading the designer's mind. It's not a skill-based mechanic, let's put it that way. Right. Now, uh, on the positive side, though, uh, like, let's say this game was directing you well. Uh, it has a lot of other really good things going for it. Okay, yeah, so let's let's stop shitting all over this game. <laughs> this game that we both said we loved to pieces. And actually talk about why this game is really one of the great games of not only the NES era, but just generally all the time. Because I think there's a lot of stuff people take for granted uh, as just sort of modern design ideas. But we're actually pretty innovative when you look at this game, at, you know, actually compared to its peers. Right, and, it, you know, the, the designers who were designing this game and games of this era were right. inventing the rules that we take for granted these days. In inventing the tropes and the genres and stuff that we can just recite from memory. Uh, you know, For example, before I played this game, I had never played a game with upgradable weapons in it. Exactly. That was This is definitely a first. Uh, the idea of your weapons powering up as you progress and go through them uh, was something that was pretty much unseen up until this point. Now, I'm, I'm sure people will be posting uh, links to games that did it before this. I'm just saying for, you know, I this was the first time I had ever seen it. Right. They, it was sort of a radical advance to me. And although Zelda was an action RPG that came out four years before this game, uh, you know, they didn't have leveling up or items that leveled up. I mean, just in, in four short years, you went from like a really standard action RPG to something that had a lot more features and was a lot more rich in terms of its complexity. Well, I mean, just in this cave, we're about to come across the wind orb uh, that powers up your existing sword. And I can't recall any other game of the era that did that. I mean, just that was like, whoa, my sword's getting more powerful as I progress through the game? That's, that's insane. That was insane to me as a kid. The idea that you would just continually upgrade. And the other thing, and it's easy to compare this game to Zelda, because, I mean, obviously... Any game, any top-down RPG, action RPG, is going to be compared to Zelda. But a lot of things that game, this game does, Zelda did not do. Um, the idea, Absolutely. The idea yeah. of having magic in, uh, as well as your, you know, your sword, Zelda didn't do that. That was this game. Right. And man, you know, uh, uh, giving you a mana, uh, that a resource that was separate from everything else to kind of limit it separately. That was different. Right. Uh, consumable items. That was, I mean, Zelda had potions, but they really take it a step further in this game. Right. They have warp boots and healing potions and antidotes and all kinds of really crunchy RPG type stuff that you, you really only saw in the turn-based RPG, like full on final fantasy type games. Right. Uh, sort of making their way into this. Yeah. Into a more real time sort of actiony game. Yeah, I mean, you look at Square's Secret of Mana, uh, which came years after this, uh, you know, using all of the same principles and using them very comfortably. Charging up your weapons to multiple charge levels, uh, upgrading them, ex you know, using experience and, and consumables. It's all, you, you know, you can all trace it back to games like this. Well, you know, another thing that was very interesting to me uh, is that this is an SNK game. Uh a studio that's not really known for their RPGs, but they were there at the forefront really defining what an action RPG should be. Also, even though this is a superficial compliment, beautiful game. For an 8-bit game, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it may not seem so by today's standards, but this is this is really a, a really late generation uh NES game. I mean, this is about as good as NES games got for that time period, in terms of visuals. Uh, like, you'll notice that uh, the palette, which is the selection of colors for this screen, is different than the one for this screen. Uh, you know, your main character looks the same, but they they're, they're taking a lot of effort to make each screen as rich and varied as possible, and that's, that's something that not a lot of games did back then. Right. 
another thing that this game had going for it very early that a lot of other games didn't was its story is actually reasonably complicated. Yes, indeed. Uh, there's this one section in the story. I'm going to try to not spoil too much uh, for anybody who wants to go play this. But there's a section in the story where uh, uh, basically there's some people you make friends with and something really bad happens to them. Do you remember this, Tony? Yes. And, uh, and, and you know, you're, you're called back because the, the bad thing happened. And when you get there, just that whole sequence, like, I remember as a kid, really struck me emotionally. Uh, like, I was like, oh my god, they killed my friends. It made me angry and sad, you know? Uh, and I don't remember any game ever doing that for me before this game. Uh, one of the things I remember very much about this game is that you talked very, you talked in the first town about how they do these sort of palette shifts when you go into, like, the inn or something. But right. they do a huge shift in terms of the environment art late in this game. And, again, I don't want to spoil it too much, but... It starts off seeming like just a normal fantasy, you know, old time game, but it's got a, it gets crazy this game. Oh yeah, there's there's you know like uh, it, Final Fantasy starting with uh, well with the first one had kind of a really techy sort of vibe to it. Uh, in addition to being a uh, you know a, a typical Tolkien esque sort of fantasy universe. This game sort of took that and then ran with it. Yeah. Uh, so they get the en the the environments, the enemies, this all really get very varied by the uh, by the time you get to the end of this game, and they do a lot of things with the story and with the uh, you know the NPCs and 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 all that stuff that you just was was really sort of a first. Um, do you have anything else to add, Tony? Um, no, I think. I love those jump boots, by the way. You know They're what? They're the best. That's also one thing that Zelda didn't do. This, this game was like, fuck you. Our character jumps. <laughs> and jumping is super useful, too. It super is. I mean, it also just... It feels good to have your character jump. It makes you feel less confined and restrained. And I think that was one of the things that really drew me to this game is... You feel like your character is capable of so much more just because you can jump. <laughs> and you jump everywhere. Yeah. I mean, like these little poison swamps. If you're if you're if you're jumping like you're supposed to be, then uh, you know you don't uh, take as much damage. Stuff like that. But to put it back to things that they did wrong, just to put it back again, they tied your jumping to an item, which yes. is. It would never fly. You either <laughs> jump or you don't jump. You don't give them the option to sort of jump sometimes when you have your item equipped. Games that do that now get completely railed for doing they, that kind of stuff. They get savaged, for sure. Um, got anything else, Tony? No, I think that's a pretty good sort of first episode... You sort of recap about Crystallis. Cool. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, uh, so what, the way we went over it, and and hopefully we can let this serve as a blueprint for us for future, you know, episodes of this type. But uh, we wanted to take sort of a critical look at the game from the perspective of people who make games for a living, and sort of talk about what they did well because they did a lot of things really well, and what sort of things have kind of fallen out of practice as far as the design toolbox. And so hopefully you've got a lot of that. Uh, Tony, do you have anything you want to close with? Uh, yeah, I think the big takeaway is that you look at a lot of these games and it's a lot and when you go when you remember the games that you played as a kid, you remember the things that they did very well. Yes. And very often the things that they did poorly, you forget about. And you just assume that the way things are done now is the way things have always been done. And that's not true at all. You have to take these sort of games in the past, and they're stepping stones to get to where we are now. Yeah, you have to and you have if, to look at them in context. Right. And it's, when you go back and look at these games, you can see flashes of brilliance in a lot of these games. Just flashes of, they really, really had something there, but either because they didn't have time... Or they didn't have the technolog technological resources, or they didn't they have couldn't the push shoulders it as far as it needed to go. 
or they they didn't have the shoulders of giants to stand on either. You know? Exactly. So they couldn't. So push these as far. games, even though they're flawed, they're you know they still did a lot of things that are very very brilliant. And when you look at them in that context, that you know they didn't have this gigantic library of games to look back on. And that's one of the that's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is one of the things that we uh, get a huge benefit out of is if we don't if we don't know how to do something, we can look at a game and say. How did they do that? And how can we, you know, take that or improve on it? Where when you're dealing with a game like Crystallis, you can't look at another game and say, how did Zelda do their chargeable, upgradable swords? You don't have that reference that we would have now where we could say, how did Gears of War do their cover-based combat? How did God of War do their, how make their melee attack satisfying? You know, that kind of stuff that you don't really have that luxury when you're making these games back on the internet. And uh, since since we're talking about that, I, I just wanted to kind of uh, say a few things about it. Uh, like, a lot of people uh, who don't make games for a living uh, don't understand that. Like, uh, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, they, they took this from, uh, you know, God of War, so clearly they they weren't trying very hard or... They just wanted to rip them off, and they didn't do as good of a job, etc. And the thing is, is, is uh, it, it all comes down to don't reinvent the wheel. Like, if you can start from something that works and improve on it, then you've already got, you know, a, a leg up in terms of uh, how much time you need to spend to get it right. Right. So, uh, For sure. It's not really, it's, it's you know, it, it's copying, but it's also... To a large extent, knowing your craft. I mean, the first, the first advice they give to any writer is read, right? Any screenwriter, they say, watch movies. Uh, you need to know what's been done so that you can do it better. Uh, Blake right. Snyder said exactly. about, yeah, Blake Snyder said about script writing. You know, it's all about give me the same thing only better, and to a certain extent, or so, only different. You know, give me the same thing only different, and. It, it comes down to that a lot, and if, if you're not sort of well-educated on the tropes of the genre uh, that you're designing, you'll either accidentally, you know, do exact, make exactly the same mistakes that they did, or, you know, you, you won't be able to reach the level that you're hoping you will because you have to reinvent the wheel. Right. No, I mean, it's, that's very true. And I, you, you take even a lot of the best games out there, and a lot of sequels get... Um, get a bad rap for not really completely reinventing things. But one of the main reasons it's it's one of the main reasons it's good for a studio to just make sequels, it allows you to fit to, you know, sand out those rough edges. Well, and, and every time you make a game, every single person in the studio is like, oh, we could have done this so much better if only this or, you know, whatever. And a lot of Places want to make that sequel not because it's easy and not because it's, you know, a cash grab, but because they want to make the game that they wanted to make in the first place. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it. Uh, a lot of people say this, but uh, I, I don't know if the emphasis is in the right place. Uh, video games are one of the few media where sequels get better than the originals. Uh like, with very few exceptions, movies don't get better when you make part two and part three and part four. They fall apart after a while. But, I mean, in, in the case of a lot of games, the third one is just way better than the first one. Right. Uh, so, And to bring it all back around, I mean, that's the sort of idea that we're talking about, is it's all about building an iteration. And until you have to have these games back in the NES... And you could very easily trace and see how things iterated if you go through generation to generation to generation and be like, oh, this is where they started trying out maybe doing something like this. And this is where they started doing experiments to do something like this. And Crystallis was one of those first games, at least in my world, that really tried to focus on the action RPG elements. Whereas Zelda was definitely a bit more action and a little bit less RPG. Uh, and games like Final Fantasy are way heavy on the RPG and very little low on the action. 
And this game tried to strike a very unique balance for its time. I agree. Uh, so, do you got anything else you want to say? Um, no, I think we covered it pretty well. I mean, do you have any other final thoughts? Um, you know, definitely play the game if you can. Uh, it's great. Um, we're, you know, we're not going to be able to do another, uh, another thing like this until after we're done with Ratchet, the, you know, the next Ratchet-based, uh, uh, season. But if there are any games that you would like to see us do... Uh, you know, post them in the post them in the comments. Uh, again, we're we're generally looking for games that were very good, but maybe underrated. They don't have a lot of, of uh, uh, coverage. But I mean, if there's something that you love that is mainstream, put it there too. We might just do it. So we'll we'll try to find something that that we're qualified to speak about. Right. And the, I mean, the only thing I can say is I would really encourage people to go back and look at these games if you really want to study games. Go back and really try to look at them with a the critical eye. And rather than just saying, oh, this game was great as a kid and, you know, just loving it, that's totally great. But really try to analyze it and see sort of where they were coming from and try to figure out exactly what was going on. And you can get a really new appreciation for these games when you go back and look at them that way. And that's sort of where I am with Crystallis. Is that, sure, it's not as great as I remember it as a kid, but I can appreciate a lot of the things they did a lot more than I could when I was a kid. And now we can sort of reap the benefits of the things that they learned back in the day. Right. So for developer commentary on uh, Crystallis, my name is Mike Stout. And I'm Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time. That went well. Yeah, I hope it's not too much wankery, but we'll see. <laughs>